enjoy a narrated brief tour through the pre 1920s section of the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum's Udvar Hazy Center. This tour features aircraft from the Langley Aerodrome through World War I aircraft. The museum is free to visit and is in Chantilly, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. After successful flights of Professor Samuel Langley's small scale unmanned aerodromes No. 5 and 6 in 1896, he obtained a $50,000 grant to build a full scale aerodrome capable of manned flight. Its airframe was an upscale version of the models that was structurally weak and had poor control systems. There were two unsuccessful attempts to launch Aerodrome A, with both resulting in the craft plunging into the water. The Smithsonian put it on public display in 1918. Louis Blériot achieved immortality in a Blériot Type 11 on July 25, 1909, when he made the first airplane crossing of the English Channel, covering the 40 kilometers between Calais and Dover. Thomas Scott Baldwin's airplanes were like the popular Curtis Pusher design, but it was innovative in that it had steel tube structural components. Baldwin called his new machine the Red Devil III, and thereafter each of his airplanes would be known as a Baldwin Red Devil. By mid-1911, Baldwin was training pilots, taking up passengers, and performing regularly with Red Devil aircraft at air meets. He advertised Red Devils for sale into 1913. Introduced during the spring of 1912, the Benoist Corn Type 12 was a two-place tractor biplane, and was one of the first closed fuselage tractor airplanes to appear in the United States. It is a prime example of pre-World War I U.S. aeronautical technology as most American aircraft produced during this period were direct copies of Wright, Curtis, or European machines. The 1912 gauge tractor biplane is generally referred to as the Fowler gauge, in recognition of Robert G. Fowler, who owned and flew this airplane. He made his most famous flight in the airplane in 1913, flying ocean to ocean across Panama. Fowler continued to perform further exhibition and passenger carrying flights, as well as flying linemen on inspection trips for the Great Western Power Company over the transmission lines between Sacramento and Oroville, California. Charles Olmsted designed and began constructing a prototype plane of solid construction that would have inherent stability and an efficient streamlined profile. Nearly completed by 1912, the Olmsted monocoque bird would be one of the first true solidly built airplanes of scientifically engineered design and structure, but work was halted when the company fell victim to the 1912 depression and the project was abandoned. The Curtis Model E was the airframe used in constructing the first practical and successful flying boat. The Curtis Model E flying boat's entire fuselage was a hull and it was purchased by the U.S. Army and Navy in 1913. The 1917 French twin-engine Caudron G4 has great significance as an early light bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, being used when these critical air power missions were being conceived and pioneered in World War I. It was quite reliable, had a good rate of climb and was pleasant to fly, all characteristics that made it a good training aircraft after more advanced aircraft reduced its combat effectiveness. Many Allied pilots received their initial flight training on it. Curtis's JN-4D Jenny performed admirably as a trainer for the U.S. Air Service during World War I, but its more significant role in aviation history was as a barnstorming and mail-carrying airplane in the 1920s. Large numbers of relatively inexpensive war surplus were available in the United States after 1918. Its affordability, ease of operation, and versatility made the Jenny the signature airplane of the barnstorming era. The Curtis N9H was a seaplane version of the famous Curtis JN4D trainer used by the U.S. Air Service during the First World War. To make the conversion, a single large central pontoon was mounted below the fuselage, with a small float fitted under each wingtip. In addition to training a generation of Navy pilots, the N9H was used to develop tactics for ship-borne aircraft operations in 1916 and 1917, using catapults mounted on armored cruisers. The Sopwith Camel was unstable, requiring constant input from the pilot. 
the gyroscopic effects of its powerful rotary engine made it dangerous for novice pilots, and almost as many were killed in accidents as died in combat. But its instability also contributed to it being agile and maneuverable, and once its tricky characteristics were mastered, the Camel was a superior fighting airplane. The Camel entered operational service in July 1917 and remained a frontline fighter until the end of the war. Appearing in mid-1917, the Newport 28C1 was rejected by the French in favor of the sturdier, more advanced SPAD-13. The United States adopted it as a stopgap measure before the much-in-demand SPAD-13s could be made available. It was the first fighter aircraft to serve with an American fighter unit under American command and in support of U.S. troops. After the war, the U.S. Navy employed 12 of them for shipboard launching trials from 1919 to 1921. The German Halberstadt CL-4 was one of World War I's best ground attack aircraft. It performed well in combat as a low-level attack airplane, relying on its good maneuverability to avoid ground fire. After supporting the desperate late German offensives in 1918, they were used to disrupt advancing Allied offensives by striking at enemy troop assembly points. When not on close support or ground attack missions, it was used as a standard two-seat fighter for escort work. Towards the end of the war, on bright moonlit nights, CL-4 squadrons attempted to intercept and destroy Allied bombers as they returned from their missions. The SPAD-16 was a two-seat version of the very successful single-seat SPAD fighters of World War I. It appeared in January 1918, was slightly faster than the SPAD-11, but had a lower ceiling and the same poor handling qualities. Approximately 1,000 were built, ultimately equipping 32 French escadrilles. An otherwise undistinguished aircraft, it is significant because of its association with Brigadier General William Billy Mitchell who piloted this airplane on many observation flights over the front lines during pivotal battles in the last months of the war. In 1919, the H&M Farman Aeroplane Company of France produced the Farman Sport 2 Place Sport and Light Commercial Biplane. In 1922, C.T. Luddington and Wallace Kellett of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania formed the Luddington Exhibition Company as agents for Farman Aircraft and imported their first two Farman Sports. Their pilot flew this aircraft, serial number 15 C-72 in the 1924 on to Dayton race, which included flying over the treacherous Allegheny Mountains. I hope you enjoyed this narrated virtual tour of pre-1920 aircraft at the National Air and Space Museum. If you would like to tour other aircraft in this series, you will find convenient links in the description section below this video. Here are YouTube suggested links on a similar topic that you may enjoy viewing.